said, I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. I want to bring you a message this morning called, This is a Test. This is a, how many like tests? Uh, I got five people that are here that need me to lay hands on them. Come, no, I'm just playing. All right, I'm playing. No, yeah, I mean, sometimes people like to. I always had to keep an A in the class so I could fail the exam. All right, I don't like tests. I can tell you five, five different answers to the same question. Uh, I'm not a real fa- fan of tests, but sometimes we have tests in our lives. And this is a test sometimes. I mean, Genesis 22, Father, before I read your word today, I just ask you this simple thing. Open it in such a way that it will change not only uh, my, uh, my life, but those who hear it as well. Those who are here, those who are watching, those who are listening, somehow change their lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Genesis chapter 22, let's start in verse number 1. Genesis chapter 22, verse number 1. It says, sometime later, I want you to notice this, sometime later, God, what's the next word? Tested. God tested tested Abraham. Okay, I want you to notice that this is a test. God tested Abraham. He said to him, I'm going to read a good bit of scripture, so let's go. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now, the region that the, of Moriah was important. The reason it was important was because on Moriah, uh, there's a stone. And on this stone, it, you can go there today, there's a little gazebo built above this stone. Uh, it is called the foundation stone. And it is believed that it was on that stone on the top of Moriah that Abraham was made. And I mean, not Abraham, Adam was formed. And, and so they would come back there to bury the patriarchs on Moriah for generations to come because it is believed that's where Adam was uh, formed by God. So it's, it, he says, I want you to go to this important place, Moriah. Sacrifice him there. We know that it's also important because it was on Moriah where Jesus, there Golgotha is part of Moriah, where Jesus would be uh, sacrificed for us. Sacrifice your, uh, him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. You need to notice that early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw in, uh, the place in the distance. He said to his servants, notice this, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy, watch this, while I and the boy go over there. Now I want you to read that next word with me. That next word is... We, come on, read that with me. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Notice that we're going and we're going to come back. Not a single, singular, but plural. We're going and we're coming back to you. It's important. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. So I want you to point, I didn't point this out in the other service, but I want you to see here clearly. He's going to sacrifice his son, but he makes a declaration in faith. Some of you need to learn how to declare in faith. He declares in faith, we're going, but we're coming back. And, he, and so he places it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Imagine he's carrying a torch, he's carrying a knife, Isaac has the wood on his back. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on top uh, uh, on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. This is a graphic story, I understand. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. To anything to him now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son your only son Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide and to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided now, your Bible may say Jehovah Jireh, there the Lord will provide. 
the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And then he says this, And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. May the Lord bless his word. What a powerful story for Father's Day. Thank you. First one in all three services to catch the irony of that statement. A father sacrificing his son. Wow. You're looking at this story like I look at this story. When you have to look at a story and say, God, I don't get it, it creates a holy tension. And I think that the holy tension is a good sign that God wants to give you a revelation. And I think in this story there's some powerful, powerful, powerful revelation because how can a good, loving father, a good, good father, say what I want you to do is go kill your son? It's okay to chuckle at that because it's, it's kind of odd. Well, I think we have to remember the very first thing that this passage said. You see, I don't really believe that God had an intention for Isaac to be sacrificed. But God did have an intention to test Abraham. This is a test. Now, if you were born between the years of 1967 and, and or you grew up, came of age between the years of 1963, uh, excuse me, and 1997, 1963 and 1997, you might remember your favorite show being interrupted with this. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcasting system. I mean, remember this. This is only a test. What comes next? I just realized when this goes on the radio broadcast, they probably will have to uh, <laughs> edit this part out so that people won't like run off the road thinking something bad's happening. But this is a test. You see, that's what this was. God was testing Abraham. And you say, why would God test Abraham? Why would God put him through a test? You see, God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son. In fact, I don't believe God would have allowed it. But there are moments when God will test us. I have found there are moments that God tests us, and what he's looking for is he's looking to see, listen to me carefully, he's looking to see if we have placed Jesus Christ at the only acceptable place, and that is first in our lives. He's looking to see if we're really submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, most of us hear a gospel preach that says, get your ticket to heaven and then live like you want to until it's time. But that's not the way this thing works. God's looking for somebody who will love him with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. We've been talking about this all-in thing around here, and God's looking for somebody who's willing to go all in. And the test of our lives tell us if we're all in. They come and they provide opportunities for us because they will reveal whether God is still on the throne of our lives or whether he has been displaced by something or someone else. We have to figure that out. In this story, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, remember that son I promised you as a gift? Yes, Lord, I want him. Sarah, remember that child that I promised you, that gift that I gave you? I want him back. I want you to give him back to me. And I want you to do it in a way that you're not comfortable with at all. Why? Because God was looking to see if somehow the gift that he had given Abraham had replaced him in his life. And too many times, if we aren't careful, the gifts that God give us become idols in our lives. The blessings that God gives us become more important than the God who gave them to us in the first place. God blesses us, and we don't know how to process it because we love the blessing so much we forget about the blesser. I don't know how many times I've seen that. Pastor, will you pray I get this good job? And they get the job they desired, and before long, the job has replaced their faithfulness to God. 
I need at least two more amens on that. Can I get them? I'll, you have to understand, it, it's always going to be a test. I remember one family in our church that they, I only know this because they told me their testimony, but here was their testimony. They came and they told me about how they had faithfully served God with their tithes and how God had opened an opportunity for them. And here's the story. They were struggling, trying to make ends meet, but they decided they were going to honor God by paying the 10% that we pay in our tithes, 10% of all the increase that comes into our lives. And, and so they said, we're going to honor God with this. And no matter what, we're going to honor God. And I watched them struggle, and, and I watched them go through the processes, but they were honoring God, and they were telling me about it. They were honoring God. And before long, I watched as they found their footing, and then after they found their footing, watch this, all of a sudden, a door for opportunity blessed in front of them, and they went from making these low five figures to really good six figures. How many of you want that blessing in your life? Come on now, give me it. And all of a sudden, everything changed for them. Everything went, all of a sudden made a shift. And I'll never forget this day, probably as long as I'm ministering. I remember the, the wife of that family came to see me. She said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I, I, I've got a problem. And I said, okay, what's your problem? She said, well, Pastor, I don't know if you know it, but we're faithful tithers. I said, yes, your husband has told me about how you faithfully tithe, and, and God blessed you. And she said, she said, yes, Pastor. She said, but I need to tell you something. I'm having a real hard time writing bigger checks. I said, What? She said, well, when we didn't make anything, it wasn't much money, and I didn't mind giving that to God. She said, but we're making great money now, and, and the checks are big. I said, can I teach you something? It's the same percent as it was when you made little. The percent didn't change. What's changed is you're in a test to see if you're going to be faithful because when you're faithful over little, you're given more. And so you understand when you're faithful over more, then more can come into your life. Pastor Don, so they're preaching about money. No, what I'm preaching about is being faithful no matter what. That when God blesses you and God blesses you in your life, that you still love God. Even when everything else goes great in your life and you're sitting on king of the mountain, you still love God. I don't know how many times I've heard this one. Pastor, will you, will you pray for me? And it's the weirdest thing. It's like a guy, when he's going to talk to me about this, he always assumes what I call, you know, as a basketball coach, he, he assumes a triple threat position. He can move, run, advance, dribble, whatever he wants to do. He assumes that triple threat, uh, threat position. And as he gets in that position, I'm like, and, and I'm like okay, what, what are you saying? And I know here it comes. He always says this. He goes, Pastor, will you pray for me? And I'm like, what do you want me to pray for everybody? He says, I need a wife. Slowly, they always kind of say like a little hop. I need a wife. I'm like, do you really want me to ask God for that for you? Pastor, I need a wife. All right, let's pray about it. God, give them a wife. I still hope that they're appreciating me after God answers the prayer. And here's what happens. That guy who was always faithful around God's house, you could count on him to do stuff around God's house. He was always in the altars worshiping. I always, I've seen it time and time again in 26 years of pastoring. He finds that girl. And before long, he doesn't have time anymore for the things of God because he's focused on her. Now, this is just true. And the blessing has replaced the blesser. And I'm thinking, will you still honor God if I pray for you a wife? Because I've seen it with jobs, I've seen it with houses, I've seen it with possessions. I, you think people ask me to pray for the weirdest thing, Pastor, you pray God gives me a boat, not if you're going to skip church for it. If you're going to honor God, I'll pray it's big enough for both of us to ride on. Come on. <laughs> but my point is this, life's a test. And the test is, are we going to serve God? even when he answers our prayers. And so, kind of back to Abraham here, we have to understand Abraham's in the middle of the test. God wants to see if God's still his end-all and his be-all. And that's the position God wants in your life. God wants to be your end-all and be-all. He wants to be the end of everything you're after, and he wants to be all that you're about. It's all or nothing, folks. It's all in for God. And so it's really, really important for us that we understand that God's looking for people who will worship Him and not the things that He can do for them. 
Too many times our relationship with God becomes terribly one-sided and more, and more about the things that we need Him to do and less about the God who can do the things. See, there are going to be moments where God's going to test us and He's going to determine whether or not we're all in and most of us are scared to death because, you know, that's the main reason most of us don't want to be all in for God because we're afraid God's going to send us somewhere to do something we don't want to do. And the reason is we're scared. We will, we're afraid God's going to put us somewhere we don't want to be. Now look, I'm just going to confess I was wrong. I was dumb. I was a child. But I prayed this prayer. I remember praying this prayer. I prayed, living God. And when I say living God, you know I'm serious. I said, living God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. God, I'll minister wherever you want me to minister. And I remember praying. I said, Lord, but I really don't want you to send me to New York City, Lord. I just don't want to go up there with all those folks in New York City. But I will. I said, Lord, I don't really want to go to Africa, but Lord, I will go if you want me to go to Africa. And I've preached there many times, but then I said this. I said, but God, whatever you do, don't send me to Dawsonville, Georgia, God. <laughs> now, that's just wrong because Dawsonville, Georgia, as far as I'm concerned, is the best place in the world to live. But you know what? That's exactly where God sent me. And it hasn't been 26 years of misery. It's been 26 years of gratitude that God knew better than I knew. God was working for my good, even when I didn't know what my good was. So most of us are afraid that somehow if you let God be in control of your life and you really submit to His will, that you're going to end up in some really bad place. No, what God's going to do is He's going to give you the desires of your heart. That means the Holy Spirit's going to input some desires into your life that make you feel fulfilled right in the middle of who you are in Christ. So we, we're back to Abraham. I keep trying to come back around to Abraham. Abraham, he, he, he gets up early. I think this is interesting. He gets up early, saddles his donkey to leave. Now, I've always read that and thought he's sneaking away. But it's really different. And to understand the fullness of the story, we have to study the Jewish tradition. And the Jewish tradition tells us that Abraham had told people what he was going to do. As a matter of fact, the, maid, the first person he talked to about this was Sarah. Can you imagine that conversation? Honey, we need to talk. If I ever say the words, I need to talk with you, my wife, look, she's shaking her head right now. <laughs> she, gets, she, she goes pale. She says, do I need to sit down? And sometimes I say, you might want to. Because when we have that conversation... That tone comes in my voice. She understands something serious is here. I can only imagine how that Sarah felt when Abraham said, could you come to my tent? I need to talk to you. And she's thinking, where are we moving now? Because the first time he did it, he said, hey, we're leaving home. Where are we going, Abraham? I don't know, but God just said, get out of here. Where are we going to head? We're going to follow whatever God tells me. And here's the key. Everything God had told him had worked out for their good. So when now, a hundred years later, he calls her over, he says, hey, I need to talk. She has a point of reference because every time it's not been flaky, it's been solid. I remember the first time I looked at Christina after we were married and said, now God told me something. And she looked at me and she said, are you sure that's God? Newlyweds. I was trying to feed this new wife that I had. Take care of her. And the Lord said, give your whole check to the church. And of course, I was a very spiritual man. I thought, well, Lord, if this is you, Christina will agree. And she looked at me and she said, God really told you? I said, yeah, he did. She said, do it then. So we gave our whole check that way. Uh, gave it to Jesus, threw it in the office. Now look, let me go, what happened? Do I look like I've ever missed a meal in my life? God took care of us. So that now there's a record. But I can't imagine after all the things I've put her through, walking in in this moment, I can imagine walking in and saying, Christina, I need to talk to you. And she just starts shaking her head. And I say, uh, God told me to sacrifice our children. Could you imagine that conversation for a moment? Which one? I, I literally thought about this this morning. 
I thought, how do you rationalize that? I thought, well, it sounds real bad to say, well, we got two girls, you know what I'm saying? And then I thought this. I thought, does the son-in-law count? Come on now. <laughs> how do you do that? But Jewish tradition tells us Sarah got on board. Wow. Why? Because every other time God had spoken and had worked out for their good. Sarah got on board. I think we're missing somebody else who got on board also. You have to put this in perspective. Abraham is over 100 years old at this point. We can figure that we have about a 12-year gap. We don't really know. But, but Isaac, at this point, ready for this, is between 25 and 37 years old. All right? Isaac had to be on board. Can you imagine a hundred and something year old man trying to manhandle a man in the prime of his life? I got a perspective today. I thought I was going to grab my son up and hug him the other day, and he threw me up on his back. I thought I was still in the prime, and I realized I'm not. Imagine this. And here's what Jewish tradition tells us. That the reason the Scripture says that Abraham bound Isaac... Watch this. This is important. The reason that Abraham bound Isaac with ropes was because Isaac said, Father, I'm with you on this, but will you tie me up just in case fear takes over and I disobey you and dis displease God? And here's what God put into my heart, and this is for Father's Day. It takes an all-in dad to get an all-in family. And if dad's not all-in, you can count it. Family's not going to be all-in. doesn't mean somebody's not going to serve God, but, it, but dad, when you get all-in, family starts lining up. Son doesn't say, tie me up so I can obey God if dad's been wishy-washy. That is too good a place for an amen. Mom doesn't say, you know what, I don't understand it, but I haven't understood any of this, but God's never failed us if Dad hasn't been serving God. We're looking for some people who get all in for God, who aren't going to raise their hand and say, I hate you at God when they go through a storm, but instead, in the middle of the storms, they're going to be still standing, still worshiping. In the middle of the storm, even when it comes to the darkest moments, they'll be able to still stand and worship. That's what all in dads produce. I'm just going to share with you from my heart, this year's not been the easiest year. There's been some tough moments in this year. There's been some dark times in this year. Last year, I was going through a personal test many of you didn't know about. Many of you were celebrating my test. Imagine if you were back with me 20-something years ago. My daughter is two years old. She's comatose in my arms. For two weeks, they have told us she had the flu, that we just needed to get over. Quote, you just need to get over. Your, your baby just has the flu. By the time we rush her to the hospital, she has a blood sugar of 777. Her brain is dehydrated. They tell us they don't know if she'll ever be normal. They don't know at this point if she will live. And our journey changed that day. Because not only was she diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic, but out of thousands of patients in her endocrinology office, they said that she was the most brittle, the most sensitive, the most, if it could be wrong, it wasn't your normal diabetes. From two years old, it changed our life. We went from our bouncing, hyperactive fall of joy to a little girl who would scratch and bite and scream. She didn't understand why mom and daddy had to hold her down and poke her every day. All through this, she almost died a few years later and again in her teen years. And all through this, we're trying to honor God. But the doctors say one thing consistently all through this time. The worst thing, the worst thing 
that can happen to your daughter is if she ever conceives a child. So last, it was a spring, a year ago spring. Bishop Odai is here, my friend from Africa is here. He finishes preaching to this congregation. He's walking down that aisle to leave. He stops, freezes, turns toward Bethany and Adam and says this, Thus says the Lord, Before I return next year, you will have a child. Bethany's like, Nope. They asked me about it. What do you think? I said, He's crazy. He hadn't heard from God. So what are you supposed to do a few months later when they show up and they say, Dad, we need to talk to you? And they bring in a little device that's got this little plus sign on it. And you're supposed to be happy? I wanted to slap them both. I realized they were married, so I couldn't criticize them for what had occurred, but but I was like, this is not right. I'm saving money so I can help them adopt because you're never supposed to kill my baby by you guys conceiving. Just so you understand, everybody goes through the fire. So we're we're trying to get used to this. We're talking about not, not your normal pregnancy. When you go to the we're talking about weekly, weekly specialists trying to make sure mom doesn't die, baby develops. Multiple hospital uh, stays. I go to Africa with Jeff last year. He's with me. I, 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 I just start preaching. I'm in Odai's church. I start preaching about, about how I'm going through this trial. He, big tears just start running down Jeff's face. Is he here? Big tears just start running down his, his face. And here's what I had to figure out. God, I don't understand. They did not plan on a child. This wasn't their request. This was a prophecy, a promise. What are we supposed to do with this, God? And I had to make up my mind. Am I going to live for the next month in fear? Or am I going to build an altar of faith? And this is where I came to. I said, God, this child obviously is a response to a a word of prophecy, a promise. So I'm going to stand on the promise. And I made up my mind to stand on the promise. And every time they would say, she's back at the hospital, and the worry of a father would kick in, I'd come back to that altar of faith and say, I'm standing on the promise. Well, what about this? We have a promise. But what about that? We have promise. You see, you're all going to go through tests. You're all going to go through the fire. You're all going to go through darkness. But you have to make up your mind. You don't run from God, and you don't get mad at God, and you don't abandon God and stop worshiping God and back away. No, you you belly up to an altar of faith, and you begin to declare, my God's still God, and my God's still in control, and we have a promise, and we're not going anywhere. So then they start trying to tell me, well, pastor, you need to prepare yourself. Your grandson is going to be, he's going to, because of the steroids and insulin, he's going to be ob-shaped, deformed in his face. He's going to be, he's going to be uh, born way too big to be born safely. And you need to prepare yourself. It's kind of a shocking experience the first time you see a child that's had to go through this. And he was not only too, not too big, How, seven pounds, six and a half pounds, born not way too late. Well, yeah, those are lights, that's right. He wasn't born wrong. I think he was born just right. He 
Grandpa loves you. He's got his hand up saying amen. See, somebody knows how to say amen. There's Jeff. I've been preaching about you for ten minutes. Um, you see, guys, I want you to understand everybody goes through the fire. And sometimes the fire gets real hot. But it's just a test. Because the one who took you into the fire is faithful to bring you through the fire. You're going to make it if you keep your faith in Jesus. And so the devil said he's not, was never, that this little boy wasn't supposed to ever be here. And the devil said if he did show up, he'd kill his mama. But God's promise said not you're going to die trying to have a baby, but within a year you'll, you will have a baby. Don't you remember what Abraham said? We're going. We're coming back. The Bible says that Abraham believed God that even if he went all the way to sacrificing Isaac, that Isaac would have raised from the dead. Why? Because when you have a promise from God, you can stand on it. You might go through the fire, but those who are faithful will come through the fire. So I tell you what. Come on up here, Jeff. Bring, bring, bring them with you. Come on. I guess I'll let y'all be a part of this, too. Come on up, family. Come on, family. Who wants it? When you... I guess we got a big family. When you go through the fire... I want you to hear me. This is, of course, different than the other three services. But when you go through the fire, there's hope on the other side of the fire. But the only way you're going to unlock it is by being faithful in the fire. And so today, the baby that was never supposed to be here, because he'll kill the, the mother, is standing beside the mother, or being held beside the mother, and we're going to offer him up to Jesus. Can we do that at the end of the service? Amen. All right, Dad, why don't you tell this promised baby's name? Jonah Clayton Browning. Jonah Clayton Browning. Who I find two shades of perfect. We're going to dedicate him to Jesus. Reach your hands this way and help us pray. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for this little man of God in the making. And I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you will bless him and you will prosper him. That you will cause your face to shine upon him all the days of his life. And Lord, that from within him, this righteous heritage that chases him, that chases him from both sides of his family, this righteous heritage, heritage will burst forth for your glory and your honor. Father, I thank you that you have been faithful. And even when the darkness said no way, you brought us through the darkness with the light of your truth. And he belongs to you as his mother and his father. Now return him to you. You will go where they cannot go. You will do what they cannot do and protect him for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Would you stand with me in this place? So, I guess the question this morning is this. What test are you in that you can pass and dedicate the result to the glory of God. Because I know some of you are in a test. Some of you are in the fire. Some of you are going through something that's not easy. And I want you to bow your heads all over this place, if you would. They're going to play something softly now, and I just want you to listen to me for just a moment.
as my family has stood here, the generations represented this morning, saying God's faithful through the storm. God's faithful through the fire. I want you to hear me. God's faithful through your storm. He's faithful through your fire. Even when the diagnosis has not been good, God's still God. And He's still faithful. Even when the results are not what you thought they would be, God's still God. Even when that marriage is not what you thought it would be, God's still God. Even when that, that thing you ask God for is not what you hoped it would be, God's still God and God's still working for you. And if you'll honor God and you'll stand and offer that praise in the middle of your fire, you can honor God on the other side as well. You didn't know what this dad was going through. And I don't know what you're going through. But I do know the same God that's been faithful in my life is faithful in your life. With no one looking around and everyone praying, you know what the test is, but you're going to honor God in spite of the test. You, you're going to still be standing on the other side of this fire. Can I see your hand if that's you? Hands all over this place. You're going to still be standing. Amen. Put those down. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. How dare we come to a moment like this without the greatest moment of a church? The fact that Jesus Christ came, died, and he's here for anyone who will confess Him as their Savior to have their life changed forever. Maybe you're here today and the, the tests of your life have been many and you haven't been able to rely on God the way you need to because you've never invited Him in to be Lord of your life. You've never made Him the King of, your, of who you are. And this morning, you want to you surrender to Jesus Christ. You want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You want to go all in for the God who wants to be your all in all. If that's you this morning with nobody looking around and I didn't embarrass the others, I'm not going to embarrass you. This is your day. This is your time. I feel it. This is your moment to surrender to Christ. Where are you? You say, today's the day I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Would you just hold your hand up high if that's you? Hold it up high. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who will join with these three that have raised their hand this morning? Are there others? Today's your day. Today's your moment. Maybe you didn't raise your hand already, but you said, Pastor, I know I've, I've, been, I've prayed a prayer. I've prayed a thousand prayers, but I've never really gone all in for him. I've allowed the test to dry up and cause that what God's done in my life to wither every time. But this time I'm going to make it. Can I see your hand? If that's you, you're going to settle your relationship with Jesus. Amen. All right. Join hands with someone near you. We're going to pray with these many that have raised their hands. The Bible says, and we quote this every week, that if we believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and we confess with our mouths that God raised him from the dead, we would be born again. Some of you are already going through a test. You responded, you raised your hand. Some of you are failing the test. You didn't. God has not given up on you. Pray this prayer with us as we pray with these and, and then let us know afterwards that you confess him publicly. Pray this prayer with me right now, church. Let's pray with these. Jesus... By faith, we believe your promises. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of my sin. I declare my faith is in Jesus Christ. By faith, He came for me. He died for me. And now He lives for me. From this moment forward, God is my Father, heaven is my home, and Jesus is my Savior. Father, I thank you for those that have prayed that, some of them in this place for the very first time this morning, and some are rededicating their lives to you. Lord, I thank you that you are the God who changes all of us for your good, and by this step of faith, they have begun a journey with you for all time. Thank you, Father, for what you are doing. Thank my goodness. Father, I just rejoice. And I'm about to pray for everybody who said they're, that they're going to make it through their test, but I just want to do this. If, you're, if you believe in the God that brought us through and can bring you through, would you just lift your hands up to him for a moment? Father, we worship you on this Father's Day. And we declare we will come through 
For when I have come through the fire, I will come forth as pure gold, your word said. We are coming through. I declare there's still a fourth man in this fire. You were there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you are here with us, Father. You're the one who's going to bring us through the fire. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you give God a mighty praise this morning?